Welcome to the Mad Ones. I'm your, hey, my mustache is finally looking a little less weird, and I see some gruffness in the future host, Cam Harless. And joining me as my co-host tonight is the man who makes Christian TikTok influencers quake in their boots or talk about him without talking about him, Mr. Zachary Cooper, a.k.a. The Muted Flag. How you doing, buddy? It is a pleasure to be here, and it is a pleasure to be talked about when I haven't actually made a TikTok in, like, days <laughs> <laughs> and yet people are talking smack. And that to me means I'm doing something right. Because, you know, every, you know, if I'm tormenting people with the truth, that's that's what I was born for. Oh, yeah. I, and, and <laughs> honestly, I could I could have an entire conversation about that entire situation. But that's not what we're here for. No. Uh, unfortunately, we can do that later. Praise um, the Lord. But uh, no one probably knows who our guest is. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm stoked to talk to her for the first time ever, but, um, you know, we'll get to the show in the moment. First, um, let me tell you that this show is brought to you 100% by the fans and patrons. Obviously I should mention that word. Uh, so hit like subscribe and share the show with your friends. There are all sorts of topics we've covered and the, the list just keeps getting longer. Uh, so, and you can share those, those videos. You can share the audio with someone who might gain something from them or who has a question that they want answering, or at least, I like to think that sometimes it's just about having the conversation and asking the questions that that lead someone to start asking more questions and to dig a little bit deeper, to read their Bible, to read church fathers, to go deeper. That's what I think that this is for a lot of the times. But um, if you want to help us out, share it. Also, you can go to patreon.com slash the mad ones. Um, we have an extended show. So this show will go for an hour for everyone who, who hits it free. After that, it's going to be for the patrons and for people on Rockfin. You can join us over at patreon.com slash the mad ones or at rockfin.com slash the mad ones. And you can keep talking with us and be even more in the conversation after last call starts. So that's all I've got to say about that. We can move on. Uh, so let me go ahead and bring in uh, the guest. Uh, joining us tonight is a very, a very small person. Um, she was once the horrible leftist elitist atheist screeching kitchen witch that your mother warned you about but now she's all about that patriarchy and even more about the lord you may know her from a small embarrassing podcast known as the mad ones or maybe you know her for a legitimate reason it's miss jessica green <laughs> hi it's good to be back everyone <laughs> the <I'm rocking>. inimitable <laughs> That's a great, I, I really appreciate the introduction because of its accuracy. So mm. thank you for that. <laughs> well, it's, what's fun is I don't, like, I was always writing these like little short joke introductions for you. I, it's been so long since I've written an actual introduction to the show for you. It's been since like 2019 or something. Oh, or wow. Yeah. I don't even know. Probably 1860 something. I don't know. Yeah. It feels like it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, so one of the things that I've uh, kind of started unofficially doing, I'm trying to make it happen. The The first episode of every month is a story of redemption. Of course, okay. there are going to be others that are peppered in throughout other episodes. Can't help that. But when I was thinking about stories of redemption, I was like, you know, I haven't had a long, like the last time I think we you were on the show was when we were talking to um, Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy. That's right. Yeah. I really so enjoyed talking like to him. Mm -hmm. Month or a little a month and a half, something like that. And I was just like, but she has a great redemption story. Let's let's talk about that. I'll bring Zach along because he doesn't know the story. He'll have questions that I won't think of because I know you. We've talked a billion times. Um, but also I have some questions that I've thought of since then because like and I'll ask you. You'll see. Um, okay. <laughs> So, but let's, let's talk. Uh, I've, I've never met you before. Welcome to the show mm -hmm. for the first time. Um, uh, you were a, a stinking atheist leftist. Is that kind of right? <laughs> I love the, I love the way he, he advertised the show. He called you a cringy online atheist. <laughs> yeah, no, that's completely accurate. It's not that I'm not cringy now. It's just that it also described me then. So it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> the cringy stayed. Yeah. I'm actually really grateful to the Facebook memories um, part of the oh. internet because it really exposes me to my own thinking just a mm. very short time ago. 
And um, there is no bigger uh, source of humility than your own cringe posts from Facebook in the 2010s. So um, I definitely recommend everybody enabling that feature and just taking a big old look in the mirror. I choose not to look at it most of the time because I'm so embarrassed by, my God, I've been on Facebook for what, 15 plus years? Something like that. The funniest thing is that as a Marine, and I was a counterintelligence Marine, and we're discouraged from having a public persona. Mm -hmm. And so I really didn't start on Facebook until like 2019 when I was also getting tasked to be a recruiter. And uh, and then shortly after 2018, whatever. And shortly after that, I got my call on to go work with Hallelujah Hulk and, and preach. Mm -hmm. And it's just fun. It's also fun to me to see all these old posts and, and see how much my theology has grown. Oh, yeah. See how much, you know, you have growth in that. And it's, it's kind of fun to see. And it's kind Absolutely. of fun. And sometimes you feel like you have absolute egg on your face when you look at some of this. So you're like, oh, my Lord. I think it's, the a, hard it's thing, bittersweet. Yeah. <laughs> I think the hard thing for me is I, I think I literally started Facebook when I was like 17 or 18. Like I was still in high school. And so it's like actually the dumbest version of myself. And I thought I was so <laughs> smart. My the dumbest God, version this- of yourself yet. Yeah, so far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but that's the yeah. thing. Like, I'm not, I'm not, thank God, uh, some humility has crept in. But like, I, I wouldn't have, like, I don't know. I don't think I was that way to other people, but it was just posts on Facebook where I was like, yeah. kind of a cringe monster. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's a wonderful lesson about, right? We, we become this unmasked person when we're on, on social media. We forget, right. you know, there's these social norms which are healthy for us to have on sometimes. And, uh, you know, tribalism, that's something we're definitely going to talk about in terms of uh, being a former cringy atheist. Yeah, well, that's a big part of it. I will, let's, let so I was talking, I don't know if it was, okay, I was, yeah, I was talking to Zach the other day. Uh, but he had a friend who just recently joined the Orthodox church yes. and he was That's like, who, who was really close to him. And he was like, you know, and I know you were, he said, you know, I knew you were really close with Jessica who decided to join the Orthodox church. And I was like, well, you know, she, that was kind of like her history rather mm-hmm. than like a new thing she found and joined. It was, I mean, it's new to her life, but she was baptized. So let's, let's start where you started. Yeah, it's odd and accidental. I have a story that's pretty unusual about how I ended up with orthodoxy, but I think going forward, my story won't be that unusual, especially as we see more American converts to the church. Um, <laughs> Cage <is> my, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, um, I, I had my first exposure with orthodoxy at about fourteen years old. My dad um, married a Greek lady. And she was Orthodox. And so in order for them to be wed in the Orthodox church, they wanted us to be baptized and, you know, be members of the the church, which my father and I were nominal secular people with no religious affiliation whatsoever. And he wanted to get married. So we kind of went along with that whole thing. And that's how I ended up being baptized. And Mm -hmm. um, their marriage, needless to say, did not work out. And we moved. And I went on into my adulthood only having that briefest brush with the Orthodox Church. Um, Other than that, I'd been to, you know, youth groups and stuff uh, with some friends, but really uh, just some kind of examples of American Protestantism. And my brief brush with Orthodoxy was all I really knew of Christianity. When I came into my adulthood, there were um, traumatic events that happened to me as a young person, that's, you know, we need not necessarily go into that. Cam and I did an entire episode about that with his mom. I'm not sure the episode number, but you can definitely go look at that or he'll put it in the description and get a full look into that. But um, I dealt myself a pretty big wound um, in my adulthood and I had no thing to lean on the way that people who do come up in a faith background do. Episode so I, 108. Okay, there you go. So um, my reaction to it was very interesting, though. Um, As a secular person, or believing myself to be a secular person, I should say, I became very angry at God (laughs) Um, to the point where I 
would say, you know, there clearly isn't a God. Look how much evil there is in the world. Look at, you know, what's able to be done in his name and all of the things that you could point at sort of um, mm. from the perspective of, per of a person who's not familiar with the church. Mm. And when I say the church, I mean a great history extending back thousands of years that yeah. involves so many different types of people and stories and yes, yeah. violence and also um, transformative uh, power on the consciousness of the world. And I was not familiar with any of this. Mm. I only knew that if there was a God, he wouldn't have let this terrible, terrible thing happen to me. So there must not be one. And um, I kind of hit that point in my life right about my mid twenties. It was the, you know, 2010s. And this is right about that time where like political progressive things that uh, internet interactions that happen in a social environment were really starting to take off. And I translated all of my pain into th those interactions. Um, my anger at God translated into those interactions and it hit a nerve with people. And I gained a lot of popularity really fast. In your cult. In my cult. <laughs> so <laughs> we haven't talked about the cult yet. But so basically, um, I got involved with a group of people uh, who were running a group. It still exists. I'm not going to mention the name of the group. But there's always kind of problems for me if I do. But there is an um, atheist affiliated group um, that's not just atheist affiliated. It's um, progressive po politically affiliated. Mm. And those two things are very intertwined together um, with that group specifically. Mm. So um, I, I got a lot of attention for being angry at God. And it made me feel like this is clearly something um, that resonates with a lot of people. I felt like there was a revolution underway that people were just gonna start dropping uh, their old antiquated ideas and the world was gonna experience right. a true scientific revolution. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if only you were, you know, and if only you had been there and been an advisor to Lenin, you know, he would have yeah. got twice as many people killed oh. as he really, you know, it would have been like he got up even earlier in the morning. See, you're so <laughs> sweet. You're so sweet to think I knew I would have known enough at that point in my life to even have attributed that kind of thought. I, I hmm. was not familiar with the Russian Revolution. Now, what, what year is Revolution. this? What year and what age ish? Okay, so I'm between 25 and 30, somewhere okay. in the 2010, okay. 12, you know, area. Um, okay. I'm just kind of, uh, you know, struggling with something that's wrong with me. Yeah, and right. it came out as an expression of being really angry at God. And I think that it, this doesn't mean this is all atheists. Uh there are atheists who are just atheists because they don't believe in God. But I think a large majority of the people who are very angry about their atheism and very angry about God online are not atheists. They're wounded people hmm. who, for one reason or another, got turned away from the church, turned away from God by bad churches, bad Christians, false preachers. There are so many things that are done. American evangelicalism. Folks. Right. <laughs> that you really could understand where these people are coming from and say, you know, I, I myself had a, a lot of those misconceptions. Like, why would God allow little tiny children to die of brain cancer? Like, what sort of God allows that? And that's a, actually like a really deeply layered question. Yeah. That yeah. to even begin to have that discussion... <laughs> There are things you have to, in any conversation, agree to as truths before you can start to. So if I'm an atheist and I'm asking, why would God this? I have to accept a universe where God exists and e even to pose this question. And so I'm setting up a moral quandary based on the idea that God exists. And this and, is my atheistic argument. And you're making a truth claim. You are making a truth claim about what good and evil even are. 
And for us to even come to that moment where we're like, there's a good and there's an evil. Well, those are two sides of the scale. What's the center of the scale? The answer really has to be God. And um, I think all people kind of innately understand this. And I think most people are rebellious against it. And the most unfortunate atheists are the ones who are peaceful atheists. Those are the most unfortunate ones because they don't, as far as, you know, from the perspective of, because I love all people, but these are people who are, you know, the, the purpose of in their life is fulfilled in some other way. And reaching them is an even more difficult. People who are not, you know, the, I'm not worried so much about the ones who are online being mad about it. I'm worried the about sensitive. the ones who are not online, not being mad about it. Right. But, Right. You have a good point. I think that people like me and other people who have a virulent reaction to any mention of God are sort of proving that that's a raw nerve for themselves. Mm. So when we talk about my atheism, there's this huge caveat that I don't think I was ever an atheist actually in the first place. Mm. And so, you know, there are other types of atheists who aren't like me, who are, as you say, the peaceful atheist, the nominal atheist who didn't, you know, they're not really mm. engaged in the debate at all. Mm. It's just not important to them. And yeah. we live in a prosperous enough world uh, that it doesn't have to be for a lot of people, interestingly enough. Um, well, there's, there was this, uh, just to mention it, one thing that I've seen on TikTok lately is, well, first, too much Mormon stuff, too much atheist stuff. Too much uh, our argument, argue, arguing Christian stuff. Like I made a video. I think you saw it, Zach, where I was like, I don't even want to do this with you guys because we no. there's no love here. No. And I'm, so I get really frustrated. Um, but beyond that, um, I I've noticed several videos of people being like, what would you ask God as an atheist if you ever? And it's like the amount of these videos that are asking questions like they want the answers. They want yes. God to answer this. They do. That's where and, I come in as an apologist. Well, but what, that, what's even crazier about it? But that's where God comes in most of all. Is almost every single time they start up the questions, I can tell you what branch of Christianity hurt them through yes. their questions. Oh, that's very yes. interesting because yes. I'm not familiar with cultural Christianity. Mm. Only my little corner of it. So I can yeah, tell I wouldn't you recognize the of- accents. Nine out of ten times, it is heavily deterministic sects of Christianity who are very firmly into eternal conscious torment. And another, are we talking? Yes, yeah. Okay, I don't want to get anyone in <laughs> trouble. Sorry. But I think we all know who we're talking hey, about here. Drop some names. We let's let's not spare anybody <laughs> no, no. any feelings. I don't see. I don't. I don't. I don't do the TikTok, I, so I don't know who I is love, who, but. I'm not, we don't have drop names of people, but we can drop okay. denominational names all, all day. Well, I you know, know which S- group SBC, denomination comes Southern at Southern Baptist Church, it. right? SBC and Pharisee have the same amount of syllables for a freaking reason, okay? So <laughs> because I live in Georgia, my neighbors are Baptists. I'm, most mm. surra- I'm mostly surrounded um, by Baptist people. So what yeah. Christianity looked like to me was through that lens. And I sort of can see now in my orthodox faith why i rejected a lot of that Mm. and um this is you have to understand i've been christian confess a confessed christian for like two years Mm. which on the scale of a human lifespan is nothing i'm a i'm an infant i'm you keep saying two years but it's been more now is it been more yeah COVID because, has really messed me up you chronologically. Were, <laughs> 2023, and we started, I think we started doing, we did episodes first in 2020. So it's okay, got to so be more I, than three years. Through, so it's been three I was years, chrismated, three years, years. I was chrismated in 2021. And so if right. it's 20, okay, so I had to, it was probably a good 18 months before I was chrismated that I started actively mentally considering myself a Christian. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. And then I co- sort of am thinking more about my entrance into the church mm, as mm. like this sort of like official demarcation. At this point, yeah. I belonged to this congregation. I was communing with them. You know, mm. I was taking Eucharist, like um, saying the creed. I was then part of that. So, but yeah, yeah. I, I, ha- the way that Christianity came into me extremely slowly. So it may have even been before that. And um, I have been told by other people that 
my baptism in the church um, when I was 14, although I didn't remain Christian um, in my uh, outward appearance, there was still that kernel of grace that got in the impartation of grace. That. That's right. Right. Which enabled me once um, my life, you know, I grew into adulthood, I matured, uh, things calmed down and were more stable. And in the quiet time of my life, when things were actually the best they'd ever been, um, that's when that kernel of uh, faith started to sort of eat at me. And that was very disturbing to a person who considered themselves an atheist. Mm. And I was not only an atheist, I was going to school for biochemistry. I, you know, believed um, science was the future. I wouldn't have called it a religion, but I but consider it was. my, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> I consider myself now less religious as a Orthodox Christian <laughs> than <laughs> I did when I was an atheist because you are required to have a cult like faith to the precepts. Yeah. And there's and there's denominational atheism. Oh, Ayn Randian oh, yes. Ayn Randian atheists hate Karl Marxian atheists. That's right. Let's That's not right. forget that. People both say of them are insufferable. And they're both horrific. They're terrible <laughs> people. If they moved next door vegans. to your yeah, crossfitting vegan Ayn Rand readers, man, if they move next door to you, your lawn will die. Oh, <laughs> but no, it's, so that's, that's what's funny is as I am, as I hear the deconstructionists, as I hear the atheists, as I hear these people talk about what they hate about God, about what they hate about the church, about what they hate about Jesus is every time, almost first I can tell kind of where they went to church in some sense, but secondly, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. I'm so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell how they were hurting the church. <laughs> You, yes. you you get a sense of yeah. what happened to them. I think that's what you said before. Yeah. So, yeah. I, well, I mean, I, I, I kind of know these things, but what's also every single time, regardless of who it is, every single time as I'm listening to these, ask these questions or make these statements, I'm going, that is not what Christianity teaches. That is not what historic Christianity teaches. That is not who God is. That is not mm -hmm. Jesus as revealed through the, the gospels mm -hmm. in the new Testament. That is not Jesus as revealed as the the uh, you know angel of the lord in the the old testament none of this is what christianity teaches it's what you thought it taught because you were a cultural christian and not one who actually did the work like nine there out of ten times <laughs> a perception for sure of god as the boogeyman and when you read those twitter threads specifically that if you could ask god anything what would you ask him or what would you say to him a lot of it is, why would you punish me for not believing in you, you know, and these kind of sort of like surface level questions that if you really, really talk to Christian people and ask them what they believe, I mean, depending on the group, <laughs> you know, there's not necessarily, it's more complex than that. And, and you're not, I don't think that you're going to be punished because somebody bearing the name Christian did the wrong thing to you. I think there's a very important um, part that says that the uh, law of God is written on the hearts of man and that we as the icons of Christ, uh, the icons of God uh, ourselves know right from wrong. And if we want God as deeply as these people want God, that you will get to him. Um, that this is an expression of pain. It's, it's screaming um, the... from an open, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Go on. No. I, well, one of the things I notice a lot is when Cam was talking about before, um, Christians who preach on a, uh, on hell the way they preach on hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what do we end up with? We end up with hell-fearing pew warmers. We yeah. end up with hell-fearing <laughs> churchgoers. Of sin management. With gospel no of sin gospel management. At all. As opposed to the gospel that we've been given a new this new identity through Christ through the unification of Christ. And that's going to allow us to walk in Christ. And that's going to allow us to become perfected or mature. But that's the thing is that they don't, they fear hell and they don't fear God. And a lot of atheists do everything they can to talk about God in this pseudo scientific way, which I think you could add to a lot of this. Like if, you know, if I drop this, this thing, it will fall. Why can't I test God in that way? 
is, is something oh. that you, you see a lot, right? And they've forgotten that the core claim, the absolute core claim of the supernatural is that the supernatural is not about some supernatural verse. It's, a, it's about supernatural beings of mm. consciousness. And that's something that they always fail to do. They, they want salvation. You want to you want to come in my house and have dinner with me, but you don't want to. You just want to like show up at the door and be like, "Yo, man, I don't even know you, but you're gonna let me come in your house for dinner." It's like, okay, man. Um, I don't know you, dude. Like, let's. You know, we got to do something about that first. You know? But anyway, science science isn't necessarily a negative thing. Uh, no. To fit for faith. And the reason I say this is because I became pro-life because of science mm. long before I became a Christian. Sitting in my cell biology class, watching videos of, I, um, I'm going to forget the name now, but there is a, zinc, a visible zinc spark that happens yeah. when a sperm enters an egg. And it's des the design of it is to seal the egg off so no other uh, sperm can get into it. And it is the literal spark of life. You can see it in the microscope, the spark of life. And yep. it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like that's a unique human life right then and there, no matter mm -hmm. how small it is in that moment, everything like that you're going to become and be your contained within this tiny space, but it's, it's there. And that, I don't know that I can't credit that change in my thinking to what, helped shift some of the other bricks that I had laid. Um, but the further I get away from being an atheist, and I probably wouldn't have been able to tell anyone this early on in my journey, but I think that I never was actually an atheist. Um, online atheists accuse me of that all the time. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I was an atheist for 10 years. I was very loud about it on the internet. Um, but I think they're right. I, I, I remember being a small child the child of a secular atheist himself who never taught me anything about God. I remember being a small child in my yard playing, talking to God. No, like not that God was answering me back or anything like that, but I as a small, very small child intuitively knew when I was talking, someone could hear me. Mm. I knew it innately. And I, as I've become more familiar with my faith and spent more time with it, I'm, remembering those small formative memories that I had as a child and going, wow, no, I've always known about God. Mm. I was just really mad at him, like a petulant teenage child. And in his mercy, he didn't destroy me. <laughs> he one. somehow still one. guided me back to the church <laughs> and let me I come that, in. So. I love that you just said petulant child, because I often call atheists petulant children because <laughs> they are <laughs> petulant children. <laughs> So exactly All correct. Of them. No exceptions. If, if you're angry about God, you, that's something else than simply not believing in him. You can't, that space occupying you where your anger is occupying you, sit with that for a while and ask yourself what's actually there. Because he it's lives, not. He lives ahead. in your head rent free. Apparently <laughs> I live in the, the head of some debate Christians rent free, which is wonderful. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's hard because I, I didn't come to Christianity through theology at all. And you, and no one comes to Christianity through theology. There's a lot of theologians who will find themselves and will wake up in hell. You could have a master's <laughs> degree in theology, yeah. but you guess what the Pharisees did? The Pharisees, yeah. the what is the saying? That you could shoot an arrow through a scroll and they could tell you every character that it went through, but God was in their <laughs> face. He could smell mm. his breath and they couldn't recognize him because of their great knowledge and what they wanted to believe. But anyway. And they really wanted to convince him to yes. be like them yep. and to affirm what they've been saying the whole time. Yep. And when they, they didn't, he, they got mad. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like the more things change, the more they stay the same because you can, everybody thinks everything's so much, so much more modern because of technology. Therefore humans are just a different species than they were in biblical times. And they weren't. We're the exact same kind of thick skulled idiots that were running around in biblical times who really honestly need the guidance. So, you know, this is what I've come to appreciate about the church is like, uh, all of the things in our 
current modern day culture that you thought were strong things that you could lean against, like the scientific method, uh, or at least the way that it's being employed, the government, um, all of those institutions that you felt were rock solid aren't. And a lot of people are having that kind of thing ripped out from underneath them. And what is the immutable thing? What is the thing that does not shift? that you can lean on and no matter how hard you press against it. And this is this is how one meets the qualifications of the scientific uh, method, by the way, <laughs> is no matter how much you challenge it, it stands immutable and unbroken. And yep. that, <laughs> that is what you can lean against. I, I want to kind of go into like the transformation that you've had and that you felt and the reality of Christianity versus the sing song and dance picture that people like to paint of becoming Christian. I'd love to kind of go into that because I feel like there's a lot of no, not reality, irreality. I don't know what, 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 there's a lot of false falsehoods in the way people mm. talk about, Oh, well, you're going to be saved and everything's going to be good and perfect nonsense. Mm. Uh, but before we do that, um, I wanted, I, there was this thing that I've been wanting to tell both of you and see if you can guess where the what uh school of thought this question comes from and also okay. uh your reaction as christians to this this question okay okay um because it it made it made me laugh it made me laugh when i read it all right why would an unembodied god create an embodied man to achieve a disembodied immortality That has to be an atheist asking that question because, and maybe I'm wrong, it's but not, it sounds an like an atheist question. Yeah. The, here's, it's here's, here's the wording that is, that is telling if you know anything about this sect, an unembodied God. So it's telling you they believe in an embodied God. Oh, hmm. Interesting. not every, not every rapist is a blank. But every blank is a rapist. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's a, there. It's I got a, away it, with it. It was a, a question from a Mormon, and I read. I read that question. Oops. How would an unembodied? Why would an unembodied God create an embodied man to achieve a disembodied immortality? And my thought was that is not what Christianity teaches. No, homie. I I never met a Mormon that I didn't like. They're really nice people, but um, I don't get it. I do not get it. When I well, sorry, so I'm, I'm sort of there with you. Personal friends of mine that I've had who were Mormons were were good folks, you know. And hmm. then being in the military, of course, I was an apologist before I even knew what that meant because I had to have, you know, polite professional conversations about religion with atheists, with pagans, with Mormons, with every butcher baker and candlestick maker that calls themselves an evangelical, you know, and so on. But um. But you know, but oh, the sharp. the the hierarchical organization is filthier than what is underneath of the pig pig crap. So I mean, they're they're just horrifically horrific groomers and terrible human beings, without yeah, it's a, without question. Like that the the whole the whole cult started with a guy who wanted a bunch of wives, and who was a professional scam artist before he started his religion so it's like mm. of ask, course ask I mean, like, any ex -mo. Yeah, yeah. and they will tell children. you that brigham young had that had joseph smith killed every ex-mormon believes this and, and then really? so there all tons of them do man there are a lot Fourth of people funny. who subscribe to titles that um that belief that the, a belief structure comes with that title but the laity group of that belief system don't always believe all of that and nominally are pretty good people and and do have the law of god written on their hearts so they know in the moment to do the right thing when the right thing strikes i think i i truly i have faith that most people are like that and it's, well and that's just what's crazy is they they uh, kind of the the difference between um someone and well, funny enough no offense to your church in particular, Jessica, but it was a caged uh, cage <laughs> guy who was like okay. Protestants, which I don't count myself among Protestants. I'm not 
I'm not a Protestant. I didn't protest anything. Um, you know, when for, Orthodox I'm, say that, they basically mean anybody who's not Catholic. Well, I know. Like, That's how right. most people use it. But right. it's like, I'm not, they all, this person was putting people, were pigeon, was pigeonholing people with this term because he was saying okay. Protestants were like Mormons because they, the Reformation was no different than the Mormon church doing their restoration. Very different <laughs> situation. Uh. There was Very a wonderful, different. there's an outstanding lecture by doctor and uh, father, I believe he's a bishop, I believe he's in Georgia in the United States, his name is Father Papa Giorgio Paniotis, and he did his PhD work on the Reformation, knowing almost nothing about it, and he does the most outstanding, he did one of the most outstanding lectures, I've listened to that lecture so many times, because I'm one who likes to digest information over again about the, the unbelievable similarities between the orthodoxy and the protestants and yeah. he talked about how orthodoxy it really like the first protestants because they rejected charlemagne's theological changes in with the council of constantinople and i believe that was 789 to 7 or 889 880 and um he talked so much about the suffering that the Orthodox Christians went through at the hands of the then persecuting Catholic Church mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the the realities. And he talked about how he had the highest praise for John Wesley. He said that, mm -hmm. that Wesley and thought is where Orthodoxy and and uh, Protestantism need to meet. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it was a very powerful lecture rejecting the Augustinian realities because Mark of Ephesus in this 15th century there was pressure by the Ottoman Empire to destroy the churches of the East, of course. And uh, Mark of Ephesus, uh, a lot of uh, Orthodox Christians, we're going to drop a firebomb here. This is going to be fun. There's a lot of Orthodox Christians who said, all right, we're going to rejoin the Catholic Church for protection. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But Mark of yeah. Ephesus had uh, debates with the cardinals, and he realized that because of Augustine's teaching and the core teachings of juridical ideas and rational ideas, that that was not possible. So to this very day, when people say that they are Eastern Catholic, all Eastern Catholics are really their Orthodox that gave their banners back to the, the Pope. That's where they come from. Interesting. No I've, I've heard question about West, it. I've heard of Western Rite Orthodox, but I've East, not heard of Eastern Catholic. Yeah, Eastern Rite, Eastern Rite, Byzantine Rite Catholicism. And they allow okay, their, their priests to marry and so on. And hmm. those are those are their Orthodox Christians that gave their banners back and did not listen to Mark of Ephesus. Mark of Ephesus' successor, Gregory Scholasticus, was a huge fan of Augustine. And on his deathbed, Mark of Ephesus summoned Gregory Scholasticus and warned him against those writings, saying that that was the that was the cornerstone. Augustine's teachings were the linchpin that caused the schism in the first place. So according to, hmm. you know, it's pretty it's pretty wild stuff when you read. And I learned about that from Archbishop Lazar, who is the Archbishop of Can of uh, Orthodoxy in, in America and Canada. He's a wonderful man. Wonderful man. That's very interesting. Yeah, I was not aware of that. Um, I know that, um, at least from the people that I'm familiar with, that Augustine is not considered um, within the canon of Orthodoxy. Yep. Um, right. So not I'm not terribly... Calendar. Yeah. No, no. And so they're, you know, pretty much post-schism, a lot of the Catholic saints are not recognized by the Orthodox mm -hmm. Church. They have their own set of, and, and in fact, quite a long list of qualifications to become a saint. Um, and although there's a lot of uh, appearance similarities between Catholics and um, Eastern Orthodox, they're theologically very different in their practice. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I, the most common question I get from sort of like people around me is, so that's like Catholic, right? And I have to pause because my church is called the Eastern Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church, Catholic meaning universal. So I'm a Catholic technically, um, but what they mean is a Western Latin Catholic, right. which is a whole different ball game. Yeah. They believe in the Immaculate Conception of Mary. They believe in um, transubstantiation, things of this nature that are not Orthodox beliefs. So, uh, yes, we have vestments and our vestments look a lot like their vestments, but the, the backing of, uh, why we're doing these things is very different. Yeah. You know, what's funny is I just, re I just realized 
one of the reasons that I ended up being um, interested in talking to Zach in the first place was because it was one of the first conversations we had was um, he was saying that people are always think that he's orthodox because of how he speaks about theology. And I hmm. was like, yeah, I, me too. Every time my orthodox friend takes things that I say to her, yeah. <laughs> to her, uh, her priest, he's, he always gives me kudos. So I, I, I can say the same. And that's how, that, so actually you, can't you were see instrumental it, in that connection. But I wear a nice little Ethiopian orthodox cross. Okay. So um, I believe that's the Coptic Church. They are, yes, and they're they in are. schism since Constantinople. Yes. Yeah, the uh, the Monophysite. Um, yeah, they right. say Miaphysite, so, but yeah. But which, um, interestingly, if you talk to cops, they cops, <laughs> which I think is kind of fun to say. If you talk to cops, to cops um, theologically, <laughs> as a person, they're not Monophysites, and they do mm -hmm. um, confess the divinity. So yeah, it's. Very interesting. That's what I was kind of alluding to earlier when I was talking about the laity of most of these sort of like groups yeah. that surround the larger truth here. Um, it's like um, I once heard a bishop describe it as there are coals burning in a hot fire and you can take a coal with you and um, start another fire with it or that coal can go dead and cold depending mm -hmm. on how you nurture that flame. And so there are, are people I think who have you know, the proper faith, the, the, the faith taught by Christ that they're carrying with them, that fire is true. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, um, even though they might belong to this title and under mm -hmm. this title is this set of theological beliefs, that person who calls themselves a Coptic or um, a Protestant or a Anabaptist or any of every other group <laughs> that sprung out of this thing, that person might not actually subscribe to the chain of things that they there was say a wonderful. They do. I'll okay. just let you know, I laughed just then because I heard the word Anabaptist and I know that that uh, gets all up in Zach's craw. So oh. <laughs> I, I think, I think it's more that I'm one of those people that really pisses them off and they just have to let me know about it. And I'm like, if you have a, if you want to give me a piece of your mind, keep it, just keep it. I don't want it. I don't want it to keep it. But that's what's so funny but, is like that that statement is emblematic. You would think it would like like you said, Jessica, it sounds like an atheist asking a question, but really it's that kind of atheistic idea that went into Joseph Smith's restoration of the mm -hmm. god of the true gospel was that God has a body and he always had a body, and we are embodied and we live it, it, their 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 cosmology is so bizarre, dude. I, 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 do you remember we talked to Ben about it? I remember do. Spirit I Blood? remember in the middle of him saying something like that, I, the words that's blasphemy just came out of like, <laughs> I whispered it. I thought I was being quiet and I was like, that's blasphemy. I watched that, like, I watched that episode and you you were like, I need to crack a beer over this one. Yeah. <laughs> so <that's> I, <laughs> I was like, oh, we're going oh, crazy, man. crazy. Cool. Let me get drunk <laughs> before we do that. But that's it's the perfect question. And that's why the reason I brought it up is because it shows such a deep misunderstanding of not just Christianity as a whole, but of the Bible. Like they say that the, the Mormons say that the, the Bible is corrupted. That's why you can't trust it. That's why Joseph Smith had to write his own, uh, you know, uh, King James Version fan fiction. Like that's why he had to do that because it was corrupted. It's like, but the. If if it was corrupted, then if it was corrupted, if it was a bad field, then why did you plant new seeds in the bad field? That mm. doesn't make any sense. If you tell me that the Bible is corrupted, then you shouldn't. You have no no Bible to stand on at all, and that's the problem I have with that. But this anyway. is one of the things. One of the areas where Cam and I have actually um, have a disagreement um, is about being able to commune people who are not orthodox at mm -hmm. Eucharist. And um, I think about a person, for example, who is Mormon, um, who the words on their lips are Christ, Jesus Christ, they say. Mm -hmm. And I'm a Christian too, but theologically they're not. Yeah. No, they're not. And so to have that person come up to the cup and receive the blood of Christ, uh, they're taking on a responsibility 
um, the responsibility given to us in the Sermon on the Mount when um, our responsibilities and uh, are explained to us. You're undertaking something consciously. You're consenting to it when you become part of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And some of that is the death of self. These are not easy roads to travel. So if an unwitting, uneducated person who doesn't know what they're doing comes up and takes that blood into them, that's a responsibility that they might not be willing to bear. And it's it's not fair to them to commune them. Paul says, and Paul so, says anyone who takes the uh, Eucharist in an unworthy manner shall die. Mm-hmm. Have died. So have the idea, died. the idea that and oh man, I'm, uh, I live in North Carolina. Camson, where are you? Where do you live? Florida. So she's in Georgia. So mm-hmm. oh man, so we're all over the ba- the the area where the people. Oh well, he just says they fall asleep. Bro. Yeah, has it ever been no. that way in that no, book it's not, ever? Yeah, no, <laughs> no, it's a euphemism for the big sleep, the death sleep. Yo, know, and usually if you go to sleep in a story in the Bible, there's an after part where you wake up and then tell people what you found out, or yeah. you know, there's usually like an after part. I don't know. I um so it, interestingly, I was watching a documentary about um medieval Europe, and this would be more in the Catholic realm of things but um back in those days almost no one received they never believed themselves to be worthy so they wouldn't go up to the cup and um they would take the 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 panis benedictus which was the blessed bread and they would take that instead but they would never go up and receive the blood and that was a very like privileged and cut off kind of a thing um so i can see rejecting that attitude um of exclusivity about it when your faith is that despite your unworthiness if you confess your sins to god and repent you can be washed and made worthy and given a clean heart and so it's an act of faith to confess and then to go and to receive and to accept the 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 body and blood so yeah. these I are complicated do. things and you can't it's a personal responsibility you take it on to yourself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. rather than and so, something because see, i mean like i understand paul when he had to say hey these love feasts are getting out of control let's 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 take the, the drink back. let's ch- yeah let's <laughs> let's chill just a little bit um yeah but i've like, been to one of those and they are pretty wild so but like erecting a fence around it for even people who are confessing Christians who aren't Mormon, mm-hmm. even if they were Mormon, that's on you. That's not on the church. It's on you for making that decision because if you're but sitting it's also, in that, it's also on the priest who's serving that yeah. to the congregation. And that um, my priest has said definitely when he expressed the want and desire to become a priest, he was given a book that detailed to him how incredibly deep his responsibilities as a priest were Mm. he said if there is nothing that scares you away from the priesthood like this book like this book should terrify you and send you running from the priesthood Mm. and (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know so you know it conveys this incredible responsibility because the people that he communes he's responsible for Mm. at the final judgment it is a deep responsibility James says himself, he says, brethren, let not most of you become teachers, knowing that teachers shall receive the greater share of judgment. Yes. And all these people who dare to open their mouths are going to have to, it amazes me that people open their mouths on Christian TikTok who are been scant in the faith. Bro, can you imagine yourself saying what you just said to Jesus? You say baptism is not required. This is a common evangelical trope. Tell it to Jesus who said, Whoa. therefore, <laughs> go into all the earth and baptize yes. in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You just picture yourself saying that to Jesus on the white throne. When he comes to you and says, I commanded people to be baptized. Whatever made you think that you could teach them that it was not required? What made you think that? There's well, not think- even going to be a what made you think that. He's just going to say, I commanded them be baptized. Mm-hmm. And right then and there, those people will know 
There be there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it's an incredibly different thing to for you to hold a heretical belief and a different thing to teach it to others. Yeah. And there is a responsibility that you will be asked to account for. And I think that that is why there is a guarded nature um, toward the Eucharistic cup. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I understand the reasoning. I just believe that you and I can sit at the same table and we we can. Uh, (laughs) We absolutely can. And um, the part of the the Eucharistic ceremony is there is the, the I referred to earlier as the Panis Benedictus, probably theologically different for the Catholics, but at, uh, we have our Eucharistic bread is taken out of the middle of a loaf. That's the lamb. And then the outer part of it just becomes a blessed bread that can be given to the whole congregation. So many Orthodox Christians themselves won't receive for various reasons. Maybe you forgot to fast that morning. Um, you know, you, you, maybe you um, are having a fight with your spouse and you guys haven't quite made up yet. Like there's all kinds of reasons that a person wouldn't go to the cup until they solved their issue. So what they can have instead is the blessed bread. Um, the I'm going to say the Greek word wrong, but um, and Diderot or shoot, forget the Greek name. It's blessed bread. And everybody, <laughs> including including professing Orthodox Christians who have, for whatever reason, um, n- decided not to receive that morning, can take part of the entire liturgy with the eating of the bread. So it's just this this one portion of it yeah. that, for very very important reasons, is is um, guarded carefully. I just think it's, I just, it's, it's so funny. Cause I, I remember that you, when you told me about that the first time you were like, does that make you feel better? And I was like, no, no. <laughs> not at all. Not like that. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things, one of the things I love about orthodoxy, one of the things that really uh, attracted me to the ancient Eastern fathers is actually their hopefulness. It's mm-hmm. actually because the Western tradition is so juridical. And so you are born a sinner. And you're, you know what I mean? Like there's not, but the ancient fathers, you read, uh, for example, the disputation of Archelaus and Mainz, Mainz, who was a Gnostic, Archelaus was a bishop. And Mainz argued for basically basically what the Calvinists believe. And, uh, And he argued that man's faculties are bad. But Archelaus countered with the very first chapter of Genesis. He said, God made man and made him very good. And there was this understanding of the goodness and the purpose of God in creation. Mm-hmm, There's mm-hmm. this understanding of the hopefulness and the God's eye view of how things are supposed to be. But in the Western tradition, there's a, everything is dourness. Everything is dour. It's all, you know, this is the Western tradition is where we get this idea. Uh, and N.T. Wright made fun of it. He said, uh, well, there's this idea that, you know, God made man and man sinned and then he made Israel and they sort of mucked about and then therefore he had to bring Jesus and fix it all. And they and sort of mucked about. Well, yeah, he's like, they sort of mucked it up, you know, and that's yeah. that's how he made fun of that idea, because it's just not that that's not the biblical narrative. The biblical narrative is that Israel has their success through Jesus Christ. Yes. That's yes. The thank biblical you for narrative. saying that. Yeah. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment and the success of Israel. And he was hated. He was hated because all of God's people are all of God's chosen messengers are hated at all time. But <laughs> did I did I send you that that uh, answer I put for that question, where she was like, "Why do why do people not like Israel, or why are people in that uh, spiritual formation class?" It was yeah. like, why, mm-hmm. why are people against Israel? And it's like, well, according to this book, it's because they were the chosen people, and people resent them for it. And mm-hmm. I was like, so. There is that. I think that's a reason. Sure. I was like, but I'm not historically literate enough to tell you all of the reasons. And I don't want to get into it. But I I I don't think it's just that. (laughs) No, it's not that easy. No, no, none of it. People people don't hate. uh, And that's that's an ignorance of people's concept of spiritual warfare. That's a heiserism, right? When we start talking about this idea that God has declared war on the principalities. Mm -hmm. And so and his chosen instrument in the Old Testament is what? The nation of Israel. That's his instrument to take war, take the his battle axe to the nations of the principalities in the Old Testament. There's a fantastic book by, um, I believe, Father Stephen DeYoung called um, 
God is a Man of War. Mm -hmm. And it is an extremely needful book for someone mm. like me who, although I didn't know it at the time, my entire moral view about the world was created in a uh, world that Christ had come to. Mm. And the world before that was so different mm. than what we have now that um, <clears throat> it's impossible to understand a lot of that in context. Mm. I know yeah. there are a lot of people who believe that just anybody can pick up the Bible and by some magic, you will understand in your heart every word that's written there. But the truth is that the context for that book is the context of the people who wrote it. Mm. And you're not familiar with that, you know, like, I'm not yeah. saying you, I'm just sort of the royal no, you. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not, um, it's not, not only... the, the scientific revolution. It's not the Catholic Church. It's not the Protestant Reformation. It's, it's, it's not Jews even 2000 years ago. <laughs> right. For, for the New Testament, you have to go yeah. back another couple thousand years and try to understand ancient Hebrew. Right. The, the, the right. Hebrews. Yeah. Not not even the Jews, the Hebrews. Genesis, just oh, think about that. That's a mind blowing. The first few chapters of Genesis are an attack against the yes. other gods. The first yep. the first three chapters of Genesis are about you know what all those other gods say? That's a bunch of crap. That's that's the whole yeah. purpose of the creation story. But today, and especially in Western culture, it's all about the original sin, blah blah blah. No, it's about it's an science. attack. It's an People attack it's against point. the claims. Yeah. So and that's. So to understand what Christ is saying in the Sermon on the Mount to the people that he's saying it to, you have to understand the world that they're living in mm. and their perceptions of reality, which have nothing to do with my post scientific revolution, post Catholicism, post uh, Protestant Reformation, American uh, technological worldview. Yeah, there are so many layers between me and those people. And that's why I am grateful to the church for existing mm -hmm. because I can look at the actual words of the church fathers who, who do have some perception of this reality only removed a century or two mm -hmm. from yeah. the people, the actual people who this mm -hmm. book was for. That's important. And, and so I don't, I, so, oh, sorry, I'm going off on a rant. No, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, it's I, I only mean to that. say, don't discount the church fathers and the traditions. I know many- Clement of Rome are... is mentioned in Philippians and he knew Peter, Paul, and James. So if and... you don't think that his thoughts about theology are important, you're stupid. <laughs> the, re the reality is, okay, what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, go forth and hand people Bibles and let them make up their own mind? Go forth and make no. disciples is the exact opposite of that idea. It implies yeah. that there's some teaching to be done. Just give them a there? chick track. Yeah. Well, that, and, and, and no one, absolutely no one, absolutely no one knew how to read up until 500 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except for so the, the idea of a, a sola, the sola scriptura is the yeah. book only. That seems like madness to me, considering the first couple hundred years of the church, you're largely dealing with people who are fighting for their lives, pulling babies out of garbage heaps, um, trying to live in catacombs, like, yeah. and we're illiterate. Yeah, they were being, it was <laughs> being read out loud to them, yeah. yeah. Talking the about a book, yeah. you know, like. Um, the vast also, majority, vast majority of all historical Christians couldn't read. And, and then most, you have other yeah. texts like, oh, I'm so sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Go on. No, no, Other no, no, texts no. like the Shepherd of Hermas, for example, which was incredibly important to early century Christians, incredibly important to them. So all of the very earliest members of the Christian church were steeped in this writing. And no one who's a sola scriptura Christian now is reading the Shepherd of Hermas. So clearly there's some stuff that is getting left out of the picture, some context I that are not being... A, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to the the kind of the the concept of sola scriptura that most people which they wouldn't even use that word that that mm -hmm. phrase what mm -hmm. they mean versus what the calvinists mean so i think that okay. you know when, when this conversation is happening i think that there is a lot of um nuanced conversation that could be happening whereas people are talking past each other most of the sure, time sure. most of them um, you know pastor Kyle Bailey i'll throw drop his name 
Pastor Kyle Bailey over on TikTok. He does a wonderful job. But one of the things that I remember from Dr. Josiah Trenum, Father Josiah Trenum, who you may know. Uh, I love the man. I I would love to meet the man. I love him. I got to meet him and it was a thrill. I got to ask him a personal question. The modern day John Chrysostom. He was so lovely. Yes. His answer was so uh, that the the, the natural pastoral talent. I just to just to let everybody know, go find Josiah Trenum's lectures and listen to them all. He's a PhD of Calvinism who became an Orthodox Christian. So all of his doctoral work is Calvinist, and he studied under the likes of Sproul and and, uh, J.I. Packer. If you see the books on his shelf, it's full of those names. And they're all still right there on his shelf. And you know what's funny is, but anyway, he was talking about the fact, it's a wonderful, I want to read, I have not yet read, read his book, Rock and Sand, but I know a lot about it. And it's, a it's wonderful on my one. list for this yes. year. Yeah. So he's talking a lot about um, Sola Scriptura means something very different from Martin Luther to John Calvin to the English mm. reformers. The English yeah. reformers who were straight leg, uh, you know, liturgical worshipers mm-hmm. uh, who mm-hmm. believe in the succession of bishops to this moment, even the Methodists. And so when we peel back the onion, it's sometimes I see that apostolic, uh, not not the apostolic Pentecostals folks, the apostolic succeeded churches of of Catholicism and Orthodoxy tend to lump those together. But at the same time, I, I can agree with what he had to say because there's no unifying thought behind Sola Scriptura. There isn't. Mm-hmm. And that's right. A, that's and I think that issue. what most people are saying when they say sola scriptura is what they what they're saying is I trust the the writings of the apostles over anyone who was not an apostle's writings. Does that make Correct. sense? I, I, I think that it is important to trust that. I think that's a correct yeah. way to think. And so, but, but I do think you that's know what, what both... you're reading? Are you when you're reading those words, do you actually know what's being said to you? And that's where church fathers come into play. Here's the challenge, right. but here's the reason you have the apostolic writings because their disciples quoted them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Period. Mm-hmm. End of discussion. The reason they, they, that we have the apostolic writings and we understand who Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, Jude, and the writer of Hebrews are is because they discipled men and those men quoted their masters and they rigorously defended the church against the Gnostics who quoted Plato and philosophers Mm -hmm. and Eastern metaphysicists in public. So the problem with Sola Scriptura in that regard is we wouldn't, we would not know what the Bible was if it was not for those men. And that's an essential problem. With the, right, with but the all, all I'm saying is the writings preceded their writings, and that's yeah. that's what people are saying. We trust the writings yeah, of yeah, the yeah. apostles. And, and, and to, be, yeah, time, to give a fair when, a fair view of it. Yeah. When, when you're talking to someone who says, I'm Sola Scriptura, I trust the Bible, they're saying, I trust the apostles first and foremost. Yeah. I don't think most people are saying I, I agree with you. Uh, what Calvin was saying or what Luther was saying. Some yeah. do. But like when I hear someone be like, well, you know, it's not just it's like I get it. No, but these writings went around. John wrote these letters and they went to all the seven churches. Like yeah. these are the writings that we're saying we, we trust is because they were written by the pen of either an apostle or a very close colleague of an apostle. Like mm-hmm. Mark was uh, Peter's interpreter. Those are the the, the writings of P- the, the sayings and the teachings of Peter as remembered and written down by Mark. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And Luke is Luke Paul's is the disciple. same way. To what? Luke is Paul's disciple. Right. And yeah, so John right. wrote his the latest, and Matthew wrote yeah. his his own. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But it's like we what most people are saying is I trust these men, and I will trust these other men secondarily. They were important, or mm-hmm. maybe some people yeah. haven't read them. They just read the Bible. Which, if you're just reading the Bible, cool. That's that's great. Keep doing that. You should yeah. add some other stuff in for context. And honestly, I think you should expand it. Yeah. yeah, I think you should expand it even past just church well, father writings. Like this you should understand was a, other context. This was a fun conversation that Cam and I had one day. I brought up the Council of Jamnia, and he immediately said, oh, by Jamnia, you mean the synagogue of Satan. Because <laughs> it was the synagogue of Satan. Oh, geez. The, the fact that we have a canon 
this is a massive distortion over the history of the church, even in the early church. Remind the Council of Jamnia was what? A Jesus-denying temple council to define the Jewish canon between Moses and Ezra. And they took all mm -hmm. the apocryphal writings like Tobit, Maccabees, Judith, and so on, and they rewrote them into the Talmud. And they got rid of the, they wanted to, it was a war against the Greek Septuagint, knowing that the Greek Old Testament was the Bible of the church. And so when you peel back that onion, now I trust the father, I trust the church fathers to pick the can. I trust the, the Holy Spirit moving through the body of Christ Absolutely. to make an authoritative yeah. statement on what yes. the scriptures are. I love Athanasius the Great. He's one of the single greatest Christians that's ever walked the face of this whole earth. Mm -hmm. He excommunicated the emperor one time, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's Probably the one it. when we see him, you know, make this authoritative statement about what he once read in public because they appealed to his wisdom, knowing that mm -hmm. he had been so persecuted in his life. And when you see that you, it's, it's not about respecting the opinions of men. It's about mm -hmm. respecting the opinion of the Holy ghost. That's right. what it's about. It's about mm -hmm. under, it's about respecting the authority and of the Holy Ghost moving throughout the life of the church. I and think that's, that's important. That that is an important distinction, especially considering how you have these ecumenical councils that have to come after, and there are heresies that arise that yeah. gain strength and popularity, and yeah. if not countered, could have taken over the church, yeah. and we would believe her heretical things. Yeah. Well, there, so you I have to believe that. that Sorry, that the, that the Holy Spirit moved through these ecumenical councils to, yeah. to make sure that we're not believing heresies. Mm. I do think that some there have been some things that have made it made it past the council. Yes, though. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, like, and unfortunately, and it's, it's hard to find out unless you're like looking at the Bible and, you know, other other right. church, you know, pe church fathers. But it's like there are things that we talk about today that like uh, there was uh, uh, Augustine, and you can give me the specific instance if you remember, Zach, but I remember reading him trying, uh, like he was quoting Paul, but then changing what Paul was, changed what Paul yeah. was saying as he was yeah. ex expositing on Paul. And this is accepted in most churches. Paul, mm -hmm. Augustine is viewed as an expositor. He was anything but. He was a pure eisegete. Uh, Augustine did not believe in free will. This is core to his personality. And Augustine was never, uh, he was never explaining the Bible. He was confronting those parts of the Bible which disproved what he had to say, right? And so he was using, he was layering his own meaning, and he was a very intelligent guy. He was a rhetorician. You know, he was the equivalent of a, you know, doctor today, a PhD today. And mm -hmm. so he was layering up his argument. Oh, Lord, I thank thee, O oh Lord, O oh uncreated God, you know, the liturgical beginning of all the universe uncreated before all time, beyond fathoming, all this other wonderful stuff, and, and so on and so forth. And you called me, and how could I have answered back against you? Were you not already in me? For Paul said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Excuse me? What? <laughs> what? What? What just happened? <laughs> like, I'm like what the and i'm just reading this i'm like wait a minute paul says faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of god it means you hear the word you have the opportunity to make a choice you pro profess the name of jesus as lord that means the holy spirit has come into you augustine mm -hmm. is saying the holy spirit is already there this is a completely different procession of the Holy Spirit. This is a not procession of the Holy Spirit. That's all a different term in Orthodoxy. This is a completely different transmission of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Augustine is saying it's already there. Paul is saying you hear and you make a choice. And so there's many, uh, Dr. Winky Pratney, uh, I believe he's, a, I forget what, uh, whether he's New Zealand or Australian, it's terrible, whatever. But he said he's a wonderful one who talked a lot about the fact that Augustine was constantly confronting the things in the Bible that disproved what he had to say. And, uh, you know, he's very appealing to people who are intellectual. And as, as uh, you know, the great Leonard Ravenholt says, what we call intellect, God calls pride. So. <laughs> oh, God, that isn't the truth yeah, in my own personal life. <laughs> more, more often than not, and the reason I brought up this 
this little bit was so many times we get caught up on these phrases rather yes, than what the other person enough. is trying to say to you. Mm. Like, and, and that's why I'm saying most people who were saying this particular, they, they don't even understand what Martin Luther said about it. They're telling mm. you that they trust Paul, that you're telling, they're telling you they trust Peter. They're telling you they trust John, the beloved, you know, mm -hmm. That's what they're Probably trying to tell you. Agree wholeheartedly with that, right? Absolutely. Well, and that's and why, I, like every time we have these these uh, conversations, I'm all or not you and me, just like in general, I'm always like, y'all are talking past each other. There's no reason yeah. for mm -hmm. you two to be discussing this at all because neither of you are listening. That's very true. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. And so, well, that, that's, you're that's not that's using the same language. You, you might both be speaking yeah. English, but if as we just displayed right here, if sola scriptura means something to me and means something else to you, mm. um, we are having a different Ooh. conversation entirely. It's it's just like those people who are asking those questions of God, who were or like that that particular post I read. So, oh, that's These so right. People yeah. Do not. Uh, we are not. I talked about it with Naomi last week. I said, you know. I'm not, and I was like, this isn't because I'm in school. It isn't because I'm getting a master's degree. It's not because I'm so smart. But the more I have exposed myself to mm -hmm. Christianity, to the Bible, to the writings of church fathers, to all of these things, to the context and the understanding of the, the ancient Hebrew people, I am speaking now a different language than most other people are yes. when we're mm -hmm. talking about God. Yes. Like when I say great. soul... I do not mean what you mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like when I talk about hell, I do not mean what you mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a very different thing because we're, we are not speaking the same language. And that's why so much of this is unhelpful because the, the person, I, I, Zach, which by the way, after we get through this little bit of heated cam talk, uh, we'll, we'll do the, the last question and go into last call. Um, <laughs> the people who were arguing, it was the Howley Hulk, your buddy, said, yeah. you know, if you believe in once saved, always saved, I'll um I have a a, a wood uh, a wood fireplace to sell you. <laughs> Something like that. Like he, I, yeah. he said, you know, I don't believe in this this thing. And they were just all calling him a liar. They were saying that he he had they said, um they said, Oh, and his his friend blocked me after he blocked me. And so I'm assuming that's you. Um, I think yeah, that's me. Friend. Um, that's me. I block <laughs> people. Thing, I'm not, I'm not here to entertain debating Christians. The, the, the next that's thing. That's so interesting. When said, I hear, when I heard you say once saved, always saved, I kind of went, wasn't well, salvation like a continuing process? Yes. So that's an interesting, we, I'd like it's to delve into that sometime. Yeah, maybe we'll do that in the in the, in the after because like yeah, right now true. there are a lot of arguments going on over that, and I'm just like, shut we, up, nerd. We got to we got to stir the pot once in a while. Yeah, there yeah. eventually there has to be but blood. The thing that the person said about you that it's, which is what riled me up hmm. was they they said that you were blocking you blocked someone because you were because your lies didn't want to see the light of their truth, and I was like, who would that be? Fight. <laughs> hey i'm just gonna i'm just here to tell you that i got a lot of grace in me because i'm a big six foot two 250 pound combat marine and i just gotta say catch me on on the streets bro catch me on the streets <laughs> and i'm and you'll be too afraid to say some say some crap like that you're gonna you're gonna get some respect in your body real quick when i stand up and and i'm Are like we arguing about than you. jesus <laughs> seriously <laughs> And, and you know what's this funny? Is about let me, Jesus. Let me wait, let me let me let me kneecap this real quick. That's one of the reasons that I haven't even been on there a lot lately. Because in real life, I'm never going to let that happen. Yeah. I'm never going to let that happen. I'm going to kill this conversation with so much kindness and mm -hmm. so much love and grace. One time, I was out. Um, you know, one of my projects on my YouTube channel, shameless plug, is uh, I want to interview my fellow veterans. Some somewhat oh. like this but also somewhat, you know, I would love to go out and actually meet them because, you know, just like I have all kinds of crazy, uh, all kinds of silly bull crap in my room. They've got usually like war rooms full of stuff too. I'm the one cussing this episode. It's funny. Lord be merciful. But um, I'm telling Izzy, but yeah, yeah. yeah tell him <laughs> he gets mad, at that. but, um, <laughs> but you know, I, so I was out there, I was on the streets because uh, I love, I love just simple conversational evangelism. We're not going out with no fiery repent flags. We're just going out to have conversations, shake hands and say, can I pray with you? 
that's the goal of every, of me all the time. And I'm talking to one of my fellow Marine vets and we start talking about faith and here comes a fresh seminarian. And when I say seminarian, I don't think I need to go re reach very hard to say that he was an evangelical and like semi, you know, whatever. And he starts this argument and his wife is like, no, we're not, we're not having a loud argument, mind you, but it is a, I told him at one time, I said, Hey man, your, your wife is asking for you to go. I was like, you realize like I'm a counterintelligence interrogator, right? Like you're basically my prisoner right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think you realize that or anything, but you, I have your attention. It, it all belongs <laughs> to me. And I'm being super polite and I'm just, just oh. but then, you know what, at the end of the day, I said, you know what, man, would you let me pray with you? And I prayed a prayer that was moved by me and, and moved him very deeply. And I, I hope that the kernels that I gave him really, I hope they blossom more and more all the time because he was getting ready to go out into the mission field. And, um, you know, it's funny to me that, that, that you being a former atheist, you know what I mean? Atheists online, they want to try and, you know, whip out the pitchforks. So when I say I talk to people about Jesus and angry atheists come into my comments from time to time too. And they're like, you're not going to talk to me about Jesus. I'm like, no, you're right. We're going to be talking about baseball. And then we're going right. to talk about Jesus in a way that you didn't even see that coming. And then <laughs> I'm going to pray with you. And that's going to be that. And you're going to be like, man, that was the coolest conversation with a Christian I've ever had. Yeah. And then I'm going to bounce and you might never, ever see me again. <laughs> but, some plant, some, some yep. reap, you know yep. what I mean? There you yeah. go. I mean, you know, and it's just, it amazed me, but that tribalism piece, that tribalism yep. piece. You know, it's terrible in the Christian community. It's awful. Stop the tribalism, please. Uh, yeah. You know, I just watched it. It was wonderful. You'll love this too, uh, Jessica. I saw a wonderful, you know, Billy Graham visited the burgeoning Russian church when the when the Russian Orthodox Church was finally free to practice again. Oh, wow. And he was paid for, every time he went to Moscow, it was paid for by the Archbishop of Moscow. He loved his preaching so much because he got so many people to give their lives to God. And he even put on a mini seminary where all the bishops and priests came and the deacons came and they paid basically with their own money to sit in this like mini class with Billy Graham. And it's like, where is that unity today? Man, I, uh, where is it? I, I ran into a really interesting article um, last Halloween by mm. an Orthodox priest who was talking about... Um, did he think it was a bad thing? Halloween was a bad thing or demonic or this, that, and the other thing. He says, you got a holiday once a year, the one time of year people think about death. I don't think that's a bad thing. It gets mm. their minds, gets their minds well, on eternity. Yeah, and, if they start and, talking about death, I get to start talking about resurrection. Correct. Mm. Correct. And so it's like, you have to meet people in love where they're at. And yes. God sent his disciples out into the world. He didn't send the world into the disciples. So, mm. you know, you, you do have to meet people where they live in love. You can, you yes. can't come at them with a hammer. They're not going to, and yet, and yet yeah. receive it. you get these evangelicals like Ray comfort, who I just can't stand. God bless oh, him. He's I a don't... funny little elf, isn't he? But he's, a, <laughs> a, he's he out here, like taking the gospel, like it's a dang hammer to clobber people. At you, oh, did you give him the gospel? What do you, I guess. Yes, I did give him the gospel. I gave him lots of love and prayer and I left. That's and then it. you leave it to God because and that's then, God will do that work. Yeah, it's not you're not going to convert anyone. God no. does that. And right, so well, you have to be a steward of the knowledge. That's yes. what you are. But that's that's what's so frustrating and why, why I made TikToks and I've said it in other places about, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we fighting each other? Mm. What does the Bible what does the New Testament tell us that Christians will be known for? Their love. If you for one another. another, for one another, mm -hmm. Praise the for Lord. loving your fellow Christians, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is an embarrassment. Yeah, that that embarrasses me and it yeah. frustrates. I'm not going to argue with you. And this is why I talk later. about this is why I talk about laity having love for each other, because mm -hmm. my church, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church are in schism mm -hmm. and you could go on and on. I know people who will up, down, left, and right, talk about just how demonic and awful the Catholic Church is, and they might have some good points there, but I know that I'm Orthodox because a Catholic pointed me in that direction. Mm. And so 
that's my sibling in Christ. Yes. That's right. a person who directed me down the right path. Yes. And I am never going to turn around and believe a person that sent me into the arms of my God is is acting for the mm. devil. <laughs> that's just One of my, not possible. My dear, my dear friend who I was kind of bringing along and discipling, and now he's becoming an Orthodox Christian. And I won't lie, that was like a depressing and scary day for me. Because oh. I was like, you know, and not, you know, because I'm like, I, I feel like I've lost him. You know what I mean? I know that I haven't. I know that I haven't. I know that I love the guy so much. But I don't feel the least bit. I had to go to God and was like, did I fail here? But in all reality, no, he's rededicating himself and going to become a chrismated Orthodox Christian. He's found something that really makes something for him. From who? From a charismatic Christian who just is uh, investigative enough to ask the questions and really confront the, the, the crap to the point where, you know, and I just, that's great. That's awesome. I've, I've had fellow, fellow Christians um, who are unfamiliar with orthodoxy come at me with some pretty strong language. I think I had someone oh, yeah. call me a pagan one time. Um, but if I had reacted, and obviously that's an ignorant idea, but um, if I had reacted in anger at that time, that person goes away thinking Orthodox Christians are angry people. I have to yeah. be a steward. I carry the pearl of great price, and I have to be an important so steward for that. <laughs> well, think about it. <laughs> you know, and, and guess whose idea that was? That was Charlemagne's idea because he said, whoever, whatever Christian does not recognize the Bishop of Rome as the sole vicar of Christ on earth is a heathen. So they persecuted the Orthodox Christians as heathens yep. from that time and, on. Interestingly, when um, there were these big crowds of uh, Christians from Europe heading over to Constantinople, they massacred a lot of Christians on the way there because they looked Middle Eastern. They spoke, or I guess they wouldn't have called it Middle Eastern back then, but they had the cultural appearance of the people mm -hmm of the east yeah, the crusaders and, and yeah. the crusaders massacred those people who were themselves christians because they looked different do you remember and... a couple of years ago when ted cruz went to a um a conference of palestinian christians who were who knew martyrs who were um, oppressed and told them if they didn't stand with israel then he wouldn't stand with them this stuff happens today. All I'm saying. Tone death. Holy crap. All I'm saying. Well, that's polit today. it's a politician for you. They're they're it's serving the same, a different it's the master. Same heart. Yeah, they are. They are. They're masters. It's of the it's, world. it's it's just you, the same daggum thing. You can't serve two masters. And it's clear to me when someone makes a statement like that, which master they're serving. Mm. Yep. But let let's switch over to the after so that we can be even more specific with our our distaste of certain groups. I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but questions, uh, questions. We got to yes. finish yeah. with our questions. You have to answer have the question. You okay. you know the question, Jessica. You've heard me yes. ask it 900 times. So now I sure. want you to ask yourself the question and then answer it if you could. Thank you. So the question is always what gives you hope. It can be locally, globally, any kind of various thing. Um, Sometimes I'm living day to day these yep. days. And um, the fact that the darkest part of the year is over and the days only get lighter from here, there's more mm. sun from here, there'll be mm. more day from here. That gives me hope. Mm. And I don't have anything more grandiose than that. Don't need anything more because, well, it's like you were talking about, um, I, I tried to throw it in there, but when you were talking about your move from atheism to Christianity um, and that little spark that you saw in the, the, the meeting of the egg and the, the sp sperm, mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that's Romans one. He shows himself in creation. It is. Man is without excuse. Mm. That it, you, you were quoting Romans one without knowing it. Creation knowing is, it because... is all the revelation of goodness and evil that we need. Because the law of God's written on our hearts. That's right. It's, yep. it's how we know right from wrong because you are the icon of God. He made you in him as his image. And so you have to act like it. And if I could add one thing to anyone who's still listening is just you have, you have a father. You have the most high father. Mm -hmm. 
act like it. Yeah. Um, so, Zach, if people want to find you on everywhere, it's at the muted flag. Yeah, muted flag. Um, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I think that's it for you. Yes. And then Jessica, do you do you do like a podcast every now and then that you're a part of, or at, at one point where? permanent yeah. that you'd like to shout out or uh i know you're at soup canarchist on twitter if people soup want to canarchist on twitter yeah if you if you're just really into lady posting that's you know what i <laughs> offer in that department um <laughs> no i actually um I, I i've taken over a lot of the like the digital more like the digital and uh social uh duties for my church and that's been taking up a lot of my time lately so um, I'm working with a um, really wonderful pro-life program as well and um, doing some digital art and work with them to uh, get their program in Atlanta rolling. So um, I may have things to share later, but um, just building a lot of groundwork right now. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're here because I miss you. You are a, uh, always a good part of the show. And it's, it's like, you can't, I can't replace you but I have to bring on two people to try. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad to have you have you back on here now. And I'm going to talk you into doing some more in the future because there's some people that I've been like, Jessica, you would have loved this. <laughs> you would have yeah. had so many questions. You two have such an awesome bromance. <laughs> the, um, yeah, we're in a really unique period right now where uh, well, I'm with you. I understand. some old things got cleared away. And so there's a lot of opportunity um, for what's being built. And uh, I have to, to ask you, up. yeah, in the theme of the questions, I have to ask you a quick, evil, funny question. Okay. And, you're gonna, and I want you to, uh, okay. So, uh. <laughs> Marvel Universe or DC Universe? Oh, I'm not, she's gonna say neither. You, you have you? to pick <laughs> one. You cannot really? say both. No, you must pick well, one. So, it's Comic not DC or movies. The, I really just in general, the comic. Uh, yeah, I'm a big comic. I'm an old. I had hundreds of X Men comics myself, but I want to hear from you, DC or Marvel. Ready? It's Ready not DC. Go. Yeah, mm. it's Marvel. It's okay. Marvel all the way. Okay. I, I, I grew up on X Men. Um, team, team Marvel yeah. all the way. I watched Captain America get assassinated on the steps of the courthouse, mm. and um, yeah, so <laughs> those movies, those movies brought the Avengers to the next level. They brought the the Avengers were flagging in the 90s and the X-Men were like on top of everything. And I thought the movies just really, really upped the game on the Avengers. I think there's a lack of human stories now. Yeah. Everything is magical, vampire, werewolf, superhero, shooting mm -hmm. laser beams out of your eyes. And although you insert human stories into those frames, you never just tell stories about humans anymore. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would prefer it if um movie makers were not making for mass audiences but that's how they're gonna you know make their money and fund their projects so mm -hmm. um it's unfortunate we're seeing uh th things like uh I'm, I'm trying to think of example um remains of the day could not be made anymore mm -hmm. something like um how about them apples what's that movie uh, but the college oh, uh, student, yes, yeah, Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill I don't hunting. think they'd make Goodwill Hunting now. Yeah, no, they wouldn't. Yeah, Unle wouldn't. unless unless Will was now a transgender black woman, then they would. <laughs> oh, I'm man. looking forward to the black remake of all the movies. I think that Black Das Boot is going to be a thrilling ride. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, personally, uh, the, I'm the for it. For, the hunt for Black October is going to be incredible. If, um, if the, if the if they if that's what we have to do to get human stories again, I'm fine with it. Just nobody who could shoot a laser beam out of their eyes, please God. <laughs> okay, so Zach, I will answer your question: Marvel versus DC. Mm. After we get through this bit in the in the extended episode, yeah. but before that, um, I will let you know that Miss Naomi Wright's going to be back next week. We're gonna we talked about her time in the cult and getting out of it. Next week, we're gonna be talking about how to. Uh, heal from spiritual abuse. Um, she mm. was in a cult, had to heal Praise from that. And she works with with people who have been abused both in cults and outside of cults and work through their spiritual abuse. So we'll be doing that next week. 
either of you are invited if you want to join me on that conversation. Um, but other than that, um, I, uh, if you want to help us out, you can go to Patreon. I still say us. I can't not, Jessica. I can't not say us. That's okay. You help us I'm out, here. So it is uh, us. Yeah. <laughs> you can go to Patreon.com. The Mad Ones. Uh, and you'll get the the last call. You'll get the extended episode. Also, if you join Rockfin um, at, Patri- at rockfin.com slash the mad ones, you can do that there as well. Um, t-shirts or mugs, we are the mad ones.com slash store. Um, I am on Twitter at Ham Carlos. If you would rather, if you're listening and would rather watch, we're the mad ones.com or any podcatcher. If you were watching and you'd rather be listening, I know why. You know why, but we don't have to tell the man. Um, you can go to uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, if you want to watch youtube.com slash the mad ones, um, we're also on Rockfin. It'll it'll show up on Rumble in a day or two. Uh, we're on all podcatchers, so that's it. So with that, we're going to shift over. But before I do that, as always, you've got a chance to be a light in the world. So go light it up. <laughs>